The last few topics we'll discuss are fatty acid and cholesterol metabolism. Fatty acid synthesis takes place in the cytoplasm, whereas fatty acid degradation takes place in the mitochondria. Acetyl coenzyme A is the substrate for the synthesis of fatty acids. As you can see, it's also used as a starting substrate to make cholesterol and ketone bodies, which we'll talk about shortly. The first step in fatty acid synthesis is transporting acetyl coenzyme A from the mitochondria to the cytoplasm using the citrate shuttle, which also creates NADPH. Next, the 2-carbon acetyl coenzyme A is carboxylated to the 3-carbon malonyl coenzyme A, which requires the enzyme acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase, and like most carboxylation reactions, also requires biotin as a cofactor. This is the rate-limiting step of fatty acid synthesis, and therefore is the most heavily regulated. Next, fatty acid synthase is used to add 2-carbon units from malonyl coenzyme A to the growing fatty acid chain until it reaches its full length. This also requires NADPH, which conveniently was already produced from the citrate shuttle. Subsequent modification of palmitate can lead to further chain elongation, desaturation, or acylglycerol formation. Since carbons are only added two at a time, this can only create even chain fatty acids, which have an even number of carbons. To create odd chain fatty acids, propionyl coenzyme A is used. For the same reason, when odd chain fatty acids are degraded, they also have to create a molecule of propionyl coenzyme A, which enters the TCA cycle as succinyl coenzyme A. Fatty acid degradation, also called beta oxidation, occurs in the mitochondria since this is where its products will be used. Acyl coenzyme A is transported into the mitochondria using the carnitine shuttle, which is inhibited by malonyl coenzyme A. The fatty acid chains are broken at the bond between the alpha and the beta carbon, which is why this is called beta oxidation. This results in acetyl coenzyme A molecules, which can then enter the TCA cycle or be used more directly for energy by being used to make ketone bodies. With regard to net energetics, one molecule of palmitate can be used to make 129 ATP, whereas it requires 7 ATP and 14 NADPH to make one palmitic acid molecule. If a patient has a carnitine deficiency, they can't transport acyl coenzyme A into the mitochondria, so they accumulate toxic levels in the cytoplasm. Since this indirectly prevents both ATP production and gluconeogenesis, findings include weakness, hypotonia, and hypoketotic hypoglycemia. One final point about fatty acid degradation is that it involves acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase, which makes a double bond in acyl coenzyme A, which is required for beta oxidation to occur. Deficiency of this enzyme also prevents glucose and ketones from being formed, and results in an increase in dicarboxylic acids. Both ketone bodies and cholesterol are synthesized from HMG coenzyme A. The ketone bodies include acetoacetate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and acetone. When the amount of glucose available is not sufficient for the energy needs of the brain, free fatty acids are a rich source of energy. The liver can convert free fatty acids and ketogenic amino acids into ketone bodies, primarily acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, which can then be metabolized in muscle and the brain into two molecules of acetyl coenzyme A. Since ketones can only be used in the mitochondria, they can't be used by erythrocytes since they have no mitochondria. The ketogenesis pathway is shown here. As you can see, acetoacetate is a precursor for the other ketones beta-hydroxybutyrate, and acetone. The acetone can give one's breath a fruity odor, which can indicate that someone is in diabetic ketoacidosis. In both prolonged starvation and diabetic ketoacidosis, oxaloacetate must be used for gluconeogenesis, and therefore it becomes depleted from the TCA cycle. Also, in alcoholism, excess NADH converts oxaloacetate to malate, which we discussed earlier. These both prevent normal function of the TCA cycle, resulting in the production of ketone bodies from glucose and free fatty acids. There is a urine test for ketones, but it does not detect beta-hydroxybutyrate. One final point is that the liver makes ketone bodies, but it lacks the enzymes needed to use them. By now we've talked about many different types of fuel use, including glucose, fatty acids, and ketone bodies. You may see a question on step one which asks which molecular fuel source is used in certain types of exercise, the fasted state, the fed state, or in starvation. This figure can give you an idea of which fuel sources are used in which situations, and how long they can last. In the first few seconds of running, stored ATP, creatine phosphate, and anaerobic glycolysis are used to provide energy. After a few seconds, the stored ATP becomes depleted, and oxidative phosphorylation is used to get the most efficient ATP production from glucose. When exercising for hours, such as in a marathon, both glycogenolysis and free fatty acid oxidation are used to make ATP. Stored glucose is conserved until you really need it, such as when you're sprinting for the finish line. So how about different kinds of fasting and starvation? In these scenarios, the priorities are to supply enough glucose to the brain and red blood cells so the body can maintain basic functions and to preserve protein to prevent muscle breakdown. In the fed state, insulin is used to stimulate the storage of lipids, proteins, and glucose. Assuming plenty of oxygen is available, both glycolysis and aerobic respiration can occur. However, in an unfed state, glucagon is produced, which causes you to use fuel reserves rather than free glucose to maintain bodily functions. 
This is supplemented by gluconeogenesis and fatty acid metabolism. Unfortunately, glycogen stores only last about one day. After the first day of fasting, you enter the starvation phase, in which you must use other fuel sources to make ATP. After most of the hepatic glycogen has been consumed, adipose tissues release free fatty acids for beta oxidation. This means that muscle and liver switch their fuel source from glucose to free fatty acids. The liver can then use these fatty acids as well as lactate and alanine for gluconeogenesis, which is especially useful for erythrocytes, since they can't use fatty acids or ketones. After day three of starvation, ketone bodies become the main source of energy for the brain and the heart. During this phase, about two-thirds of energy use is from ketone bodies, whereas about one-third is from glucose. Since these ketone bodies are made from fatty acids, the amount of stored adipose tissue determines survival time, assuming you have access to water and other important vitamins and minerals. Once adipose stores are depleted, vital proteins are degraded to make energy, which doesn't take long to result in organ failure and death. In this last part of biochemistry, we'll talk about cholesterol metabolism, lipid transport, lipoproteins, and dyslipidemias. Cholesterol is an important part of cell membranes and is also the precursor to bile acids, steroid hormones, and some vitamins. It can be synthesized in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of any cell in the body, although it's mostly made in the liver. As I mentioned earlier, acetylcoenzyme A is used to make HMG coenzyme A, which can then be used to synthesize either ketone bodies or cholesterol. In fact, HMG coenzyme A reductase is the rate limiting step in cholesterol synthesis, and therefore this is the enzyme targeted by the statin drug class, which inhibits cholesterol synthesis. Once cholesterol has been synthesized, about two-thirds of it is esterified by the enzyme lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase, or LCAT. Esterification of cholesterol allows it to be stored inside vesicles rather than being embedded in the membrane, which is important so it can be transported through the blood to other parts of the body. Because fat and cholesterol are hydrophobic and don't dissolve in blood, lipids require carrier molecules to enter the circulation. Fat from the diet and from the liver associate with amphiphilic proteins called apolipoproteins. Together with other lipids, including cholesterol, cholesterol esters, triglycerides, and phospholipids, the apolipoproteins form lipoproteins. The lipoproteins include VLDL, IDL, LDL, and HDL. There are several key enzymes in lipid transport. Pancreatic lipase degrades dietary triglycerides in the small intestine. Specifically, it cleaves triglycerides at positions 1 and 3, giving rise to free fatty acids and monoacylglycerol. These can then enter the enterocytes and re-esterify into a triglyceride that can be exported in a chylomicron. Lipoprotein lipase, or LPL, is present on vascular endothelium in adipose and muscle, and catalyzes the same reaction as pancreatic lipase. It degrades triglycerides that are circulating in chylomicrons in VLDL, so they can be absorbed by local cells, and the chylomicrons become remnants, which are transported back to the liver. Hepatic triglyceride lipase, or HL, degrades the triglycerides in IDL to form LDL. Lastly, hormone-sensitive lipase is an intracellular enzyme, which degrades triglycerides mostly in adipocytes. As I mentioned a moment ago, LCAT, or lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase, esterifies cholesterol, which means it allows the cholesterol to enter the core of the lipoprotein. About two-thirds of cholesterol in the circulation is in an esterified form. This enzyme is required to get cholesterol into HDL to make a mature HDL molecule. CETP, or cholesterol ester transfer protein, can then mediate the transfer of cholesterol esters to other lipoproteins, such as VLDL, IDL, and LDL. The apolipoproteins are amphipathic proteins that bind to lipids to form lipoproteins, so that lipids can be carried through the circulatory and lymphatic systems. These are the five most important and most tested apolipoproteins. Apolipoprotein E mediates remnant uptake into the liver. This is found in VLDL, IDL, HDL, chylomicrons, and their remnants. A1 activates LCAT and is mostly found in HDL. Chylomicrons also contain ApoA1 when they're first secreted from enterocytes, but they quickly transfer it to HDL. Apolipoprotein C2 is a cofactor required for lipoprotein lipase, which is used for degrading triglycerides in VLDL and chylomicrons, which are the two lipoproteins that contain C2. B48 mediates chylomicron secretion, so this is found in chylomicrons and their remnants. Our last major apolipoprotein is B100, which binds to the LDL receptor and mediates VLDL secretion. This is mostly found in VLDL, IDL, and LDL. The lipoproteins are named according to their density. From low to high density, we have chylomicrons, VLDL, IDL, LDL, and HDL. In general, higher density implies more cholesterol and proteins, less triglycerides, and a smaller size. HDL is an exception because its cholesterol content is only moderately high, and most of its high density comes from proteins. We'll start by talking about where chylomicrons come from. The dietary lipids and enterocytes enter the endoplasmic reticulum, where they co-assemble with freshly translated to large apolipoprotein, which is ApoB48. This can become a chylomicron, which also contains ApoA1, C2, and E. 
From the intestine, chylomicrons enter the lymphatic system and go through the thoracic duct before reaching the blood. The main role of the chylomicron is to deliver dietary triglycerides to peripheral tissues. As you can see in this image, in which T represents triglycerides and C represents cholesterol, chylomicrons mostly contain triglycerides and only a small amount of cholesterol. Once they've delivered most of their triglycerides to other tissues, what remains is the chylomicron remnant, which transports the remaining cholesterol to the liver. Although VLDL still has more triglycerides than cholesterol, it has a higher cholesterol content than chylomicrons. An important distinction between VLDL and chylomicrons is that VLDL is secreted by the liver, whereas chylomicrons come from the intestine. However, VLDL and chylomicrons have a similar function, which again is to deliver triglycerides to peripheral tissues. After they've delivered some triglycerides, the VLDL remnants are called intermediate density lipoproteins, or IDL. Although IDL can be taken up by the liver, it often just loses its APOE and becomes LDL. The main apolipoprotein in LDL is B100, and its function is to deliver hepatic cholesterol to the peripheral tissues. During the transitions from VLDL to IDL and from IDL to LDL, lipoprotein lipase was used to allow triglycerides to be delivered to tissues. Therefore, in LDL, mostly cholesterol remains. LDL and its cholesterol are taken up by cells via receptor-mediated endocytosis. This means that cells need to have the LDL receptor to take up cholesterol from LDL. We'll talk about this more in a minute when we go through dyslipidemias. In large arteries, LDL can get oxidized and trapped in the vessel intima. Oxidation of LDL causes macrophages to recognize it as a pathogen, so they endocytose it and become foam cells, which is the beginning of atherosclerosis. Our last type of protein is HDL, which is often referred to as the good cholesterol. That's because HDL basically has the reverse function of LDL, since it transfers peripheral cholesterol, including that in atherosclerotic plaques, back to the liver. It also acts as a repository for APOC and APOE, which are used for chylomicron and VLDL metabolism. HDL is produced both in the liver and the intestine. When HDL is created, its core is mostly empty, but its membrane has lots of proteins, which gives it its high density. As it travels through the circulation, it picks up cholesterol, causing it to fill up and expand until it ends its journey at the liver. All right, let's talk about the things that can go wrong with lipids and lipoproteins. A standard lipid profile measures LDL, HDL, total cholesterol, and triglycerides. A dyslipidemia is any significant difference from normal values in a lipid profile. High LDL and low HDL are both well-established risk factors for atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. Very high LDL can also cause cholesterol deposits in skin or tendons, called xanthomas. If these occur in the eyelids, they're called xanthelasma, and if they're in the cornea, it's called arcus senilis or corneal arcus. All right, let's talk about the hyperlipoproteinemias. Type 1 dyslipidemia, also called hyperchylomicronemia, is defined as an increase in chylomicron levels. This results in elevated levels of triglyceride and cholesterol in the blood, although it mostly affects triglycerides. Hyperchylomicronemia is caused by autosomal recessive deficiency in lipoprotein lipase, or apolipoprotein C2, which is the cofactor for lipoprotein lipase. This can result in pancreatitis, hepatosplenomegaly, or pruritic xanthomas. However, it's important to know that this does not increase the risk of atherosclerosis. Type 2A dyslipidemia is called familial hypercholesterolemia and is characterized by increased LDL levels. It's caused by an autosomal dominant mutation that results in absent or deficient LDL receptors. Without LDL receptors, LDL can't be taken up by tissues, and therefore it accumulates in the blood, eventually becoming deposited in the walls of the vessels. This accelerates atherosclerosis and also causes tendon xanthomas and corneal arcus, which is the pale arc of yellow cholesterol you can see in this image. These deposits usually begin at the top or bottom of the iris and fill in until they cover the whole circumference. There's also usually a thin, clear section separating it from the sclera. Type 4 dyslipidemia is also called hypertriglyceridemia and is characterized by high VLDL levels. Since VLDL contains mostly triglycerides, you'll see increased triglycerides in a lipid profile. This most notably causes pancreatitis. So that's all for the hyperlipoproteinemias. Now we'll end with the hypolipoproteinemia, which is called A-beta-lipoproteinemia. This is a rare autosomal recessive disease which results in an inability to synthesize lipoproteins due to deficiencies in ApoB100 and ApoB48. Symptoms start to appear soon after birth and include failure to thrive, steatorrhea, acanthocytosis, ataxia, and night blindness. The pathogenesis of this disease is that without these able lipoproteins, chylomicrons can't be produced, so lipids accumulate within enterocytes and then can't be exported into lymphatics and then the blood is chylomicrons. This ultimately means that you'll stop absorbing lipids, causing steatorrhea, which in turn causes failure to thrive and inability to absorb fat-soluble vitamins. The inability to absorb vitamin A causes night blindness. The acanthocytosis, which you can see in these spiky-shaped erythrocytes, occurs due to lipid imbalance in their membranes. Unfortunately, there is no real treatment for this disease, but patients should be supplemented with fat-soluble vitamins. 